Thanks, Jeff. Appreciate that. If you'll open your Bibles to John chapter 6. Might have to turn that up a little bit. There's, there's a bottle that's about half empty. Is that mine from la two weeks ago? I brought another one, so I'm good. All right, sure. Thanks, Jeff. We're good enough friends we could drink after each other, right? And we both had... Yeah, as long as you go first. Yeah, okay. I hear you. I see how you are. Well, I'm going to be here next week, so we'll have a little different sermon next week, maybe. Uh, we'll see how that goes. But uh, we had a great week in Lubbock, Texas. Uh, got to play with uh, two grandsons and saw the other one on the way down and uh, didn't see him on the way back. But um, it was so much fun. We really, really had a good time. It was uh, the littlest one, uh, just learning how to crawl, uh, not quite figured it out very good, but uh, Nana and Papa made sure he had lots of time on the floor and lots of encouragement, and, and now Mama has to deal with the consequences of a baby that can go anywhere he wants. Uh, so that's, that's something she'll have to deal with, but uh, it was a good, good time. We really, we really, really uh, enjoyed our time together. Can you turn the volume up just a little bit? Can you hear me, Judd? How many fingers am I holding up? That's testing your eyesight, too. One, okay. Yeah, all right. I need one of those, don't I? All right, so uh, John chapter 6. Uh, there's a little boy uh, riding home from church with his parents, and his parents uh, ask him what he learned in Bible class that day. And he said, oh man, we had a great Bible class story. It was the story of, of Joshua and the battle of Jericho. And, and uh, there was uh, air raids and the Air Force flew in and they dropped bombs on Jericho for, for days, shock and awe. And, and then the artillery shells started firing and, and the tanks rolled up and they, they knocked down the walls and the Marines went in uh, to clean things up. And, and the parents said, oh my. Is that what your teacher said? And the little boy said, no, but you wouldn't believe what she told me. <laughs> and the story of Jesus is a lot like that. The story of Jesus is a lot like that. We're going to read in, in John chapter uh, 6. Uh, we're going to read about uh, Jesus and uh, he feeds. Well, we're not going to read this because I'm going to come in a little bit later. But Jesus feeds 5,000 men. And you think about this story of uh, Jesus' popularity is just expanding. Uh, everybody's flocking to hear Jesus. Well, all the common people are flocking to hear Jesus. And they go out to hear what Jesus says. And, and so Jesus uh, goes across the Sea of Galilee to this special place where there was green grass. And uh, he's, he's there and, and 5,000 men show up. And so Jesus uh, teaches them uh, words of life and teaches them about his, his way of life. And, he, and they, they say, man, you need to disperse the crowd so they can go get something to eat. And Jesus says, well, how much food is there do, do we have? And, and Andrew comes up, and we got a guest today named Andrew. Glad that he's here today. Anyway, Andrew comes up, and uh, uh, he says, well, there's a little boy that has uh, two fish and five loaves. And Jesus says, well, bring them here. And so Jesus prays over the two fish and the five loaves, and he, he breaks the bread, and he feeds 5,000 men. Now, there may have been more that we just, we know there's at least one boy who had that. We don't know if there's women and children there or not, but he has them sit down in groups of 50 and hundreds, just like an army would sit down in groups of 50 and hundreds, and he feeds them this food. And it says in John chapter 6, verse 15, we're going to begin reading at verse 16, but you'll see that they came and they were going to take Jesus by force and make him be king because the Jews hated the Romans. And they wanted the Romans out of their country, and they wanted a king to reign because they knew God promised them a king, a king to reign that would kick the Romans out. And they looked at Jesus and they said, Whoa, what a king he would be. He just fed 5,000 with just two fish and five loaves. What a, we don't even need to have, you know, the, the most important part when an army goes in to attack a place is the supply line. If they don't have any supplies, they're cut off and, and they'll, they'll have to surrender or die. 
the supply line. And, and Jesus could just make, make food all the way along and keep the army going. And they probably think, I wonder if he can just magically make swords appear. He, we know he can heal things. He's healed people so that, man, what a king we've got. And they're going to force Jesus to be king. And he walks away. He walks away. And so here's what I want us to think about as we think about Jesus. I want us to read this text and see what it says. Uh, we'll read, begin reading in verse 16. Now when evening came, his disciples went down to the sea, and after getting into the boat, they started across the sea to Capernaum. It had already become dark, and Jesus had not yet come to them, and the sea began to be stirred up because of a strong wind was blowing. Then when they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea, drawing near to the boat, and they were afraid. And he said to them, It is I, do not be afraid. And so they were willing to receive him into the boat, and immediately a boat was at land to which they were going. Now that's not the whole story. The Gospels tell part of the story. Matthew tells it more completely in Matthew chapter 14. Uh, Mark also has this story. The next day the crowd that stood on the other side of the sea saw that there was no other small boat there except one and that Jesus had not entered into the boat with his disciples, but the disciples had gone away alone. There came other small boats from Tiberias near the place where they had ate the bread after the Lord had given thanks. And so when the crowd saw that Jesus was not there nor his disciples, they themselves took jumped into the small boats, and they came to Capernaum seeking Jesus. And when they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Or really, like, how did you get here? And Jesus answered and said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw signs, but because you ate the loaves and you were filled. Do not work for food which perishes, but for food which endures to eternal life when the Son of Man will give to you. For on him the Father, God, has set his seal. Therefore they said to him, What shall we do so that we may work the works of God? Jesus answered and said to them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. So they said to him, What then do you do for a sign so that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? Our fathers ate man in the wilderness as it is written. He gave them bread out of heaven to eat. Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread out of heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread out of heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down out of heaven and gives life to the world. And they said to him, Lord, always give us this bread. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me does not hunger. He who believes in me will never thirst. But, they, but I said to you that you that you have seen me, and yet you do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will certainly not cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of him who sent me, that, all, that of all that he has given me I lose nothing, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who beholds the Son and believes in him will have eternal life, and I myself will raise him up on the last day. Therefore the Jews were grumbling about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They were saying, Is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How does he now say, I have come down out of heaven? Jesus answered and said to them, Do not grumble among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall be all be taught of God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father except the one who is from God. He has seen the Father. Truly, truly, I say to you, who believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate manna in the wilderness, and they died. Physical death. This is the bread which comes down out of heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down out of heaven. If anyone eats this bread, I will, he will live forever. And the bread also which I will give him for the life of the world is in the flesh. Then the Jews began to argue with one another, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in yourselves. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. 
He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. As the living Father sent me, I live because of the Father. So he who eats me will also live because of me. This is the bread which came down out of heaven, not as the fathers ate and died. He who eats this bread will live forever. These things he said in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. Therefore, many of his disciples, when they heard this, said, Whew, This is a difficult statement. Who can listen to it? But Jesus, conscious that his disciples grumbled to this, said to them, Does this cause you to stumble? What then if you see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and are life. But there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they, who they were who did not believe and who it was who would betray him. And he was saying this, For this reason I have come to you that no one can come to me unless it be granted him. And Jesus answered them, Did I myself not choose you, the twelve, and yet one of you is of the devil? Now he meant Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, for he, one of the twelve, was going to betray him. What a powerful text, a lot, rather lengthy reading. Sorry about that, but I wanted us to see all of this, see how it all plays out together. You see, Jesus has fed the 5,000. He walks on the water. We read that in the Matthew text. Jesus walks on the water, comes to him in the boat, and the crowd doesn't know where he's at. They are excited to find out about this Jesus. And Jesus has walked on the water. Uh, Peter goes to him, and one of the things says, uh, Peter... Uh, took his eyes off Jesus. But he, he, you see in this whole story, there's great popularity of Jesus, people coming to him. They're wanting to know who he is, how he can do these things. They're wanting to follow him. They want to make him king. And all of a sudden, he walks away from that, and then he teaches these things. And you see uh, there's four things that we'll get from this text. Number one is this confusion. They're confused about who Jesus is. Uh, and, and God is not the author of confusion, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 33. But they are confused. What does it mean? What is this all about? What is, who is this Jesus? Jesus, how can he do these things? Why would he just walk away? Why isn't he just grasping on the idea of being king and just focusing on that and, and striving to be the king that they want him to be? He's done this great miracle, if you will. He's fed 5,000. He's walked on water. He even called Peter to walk on the water to him. And all this exuberance and excitement leaves them confused because Jesus just walks away. We see in the Matthew text, Matthew chapter 14, verse 33, after Jesus does those things, and even the apostles at the end of this, at the end of this text say, we, we've come to believe in you. We believe in him. But the crowd is really confused about who is Jesus that he would walk away from all this glory. Why would he do that? Why would he do that? Because he's not about the physical. He talks about the bread all the way through this text. He's not about the physical. He's about the spiritual. There is a spiritual thing, and, and, and you think about this. He talks about life, eternal life. I went to a funeral on our, on our way home from our trip on Friday. I went to a funeral. Young woman was 74 years old. Uh, that's just 10 years older than I am right now. Is Kent and Dale's sister. She had cancer and passed away. You know what her family wanted more than anything else on March 20th? One more week of life for her. They wanted her to have one more week of life, but that wasn't to be. But she has a hope of eternal life. Eternal life. This life is not it. We're all going to die, but there is uh, an eternal life that is awaiting us because of Jesus. And that's what he's all about. And so they're, they're confused about who this Jesus is because they're focused on the physical. And if you'll read every sermon in the book of Acts, 
Every single sermon that we have recorded there in the book of Acts is always focused on Jesus' resurrection, which means there's life after death. There is life after death. And if we want to avoid the confusion, we have to do one thing. Focus on Jesus. That's why Peter sank when Jesus walked on the water, because he wasn't focused on Jesus. He took his eyes off of Jesus and focused on the waves. If you focus on Jesus, you can know about life. Okay, I'm trying to advance it, and it's not going. Will you advance it for me? Okay, one slide, or maybe two. I'm ready for cannibalism. There we go. And now, now go one more. All right, cannibalism. Uh, are Christians cannibalistic? Well, eat his flesh, drink his blood. Does that not sound like cannibalism? Sure it does. If you're thinking physical, uh, you, do you know this, that in the Dark Ages, uh, the Roman Catholic Church uh, thought that the Jews were sneaking into their uh, church buildings and taking the uh, wine that the priest had prayed over and become the blood and the bread that the priest had prayed over and become the body of Jesus and were torturing the, taking that, stealing it and taking it out into the forest and torturing it and torturing the body of Jesus again. Like they, well, they didn't really torture. The Romans tortured Jesus' body in, when Jesus died on the cross. But that's, that's kind of the, the dark ages are called the dark ages for a reason because they, there wasn't much understanding. We have after that the age of enlightenment where things are opened up and people understand things. They didn't understand that. You see, Jesus is not about eating his literal flesh, drinking his literal blood. We'll talk more about what that is, it's, but it's not cannibalism. In the context, he says, don't, don't work. This is a good one. Don't work for food which perishes, but for food which endures to eternal life. It's what we call, uh, for lack of a better phrase, a not but phrase. Not this, but this is really important. Should we have a job and work and take care of our families? Sure we should. So Jesus is not saying don't just everybody quit their jobs. He's saying you work for that, but that's not the important thing. We don't live for our physical work. We live for eternal life. Focus on the eternity. That's what he's talking about. These are, these are metaphorical statements, if you will, uh, figures of speech that Jesus is using to drive home a point. There is an allusion to the Lord's Supper, which we're going to partake of in just a few moments. Eating his flesh, drinking his blood. There's an allusion. That, that, that little bit of bread represents the body of Jesus. That little bit of grape juice represents the blood that Jesus shed on the cross for us. And so there is that sense. But Jesus is more focused on uh, an idea that's going to come later on. He talks about our faith in Jesus. We're saving it for the next one. Our faith in Jesus is spiritual food. We, we might call it soul food, if you will. We are strengthened by our relationship to Jesus spiritually. We study his word, and it builds faith to eternal life. And you'll notice in these texts, they talk, he talks a lot about their belief, and they're coming to have faith, and they believe in him. A faith that leads us to eternal life. In fact, he saw, says, you know, a lot of people say we're not saved by works. Here's a work that we're saved by. The text says we're saved. This is the work of God that you believe in him. And this is the work that we do. If we work is faith in Jesus. It, our, our faith is not blind faith. Our faith that we have in Jesus is based upon evidence. There is solid evidence of what we know about Jesus that it is true. We, we talked about the story in John chapter 16 where Jesus feeds 5,000. Jesus, and we're going to read on these things. These signs that John writes for us are written so that we might grow in our faith. You know that the Jews did not say, he can't feed 5,000 men. The skeptics, people that didn't believe in Jesus, did not go around saying, he didn't do this. 
He didn't heal the nobleman's son. He didn't raise Lazarus from the dead. He didn't, they, don't, they don't do that. They recognize, in fact, you'll read in our text later on, you'll recognize that the Jews say Jesus performed this notable miracle, therefore we must kill him for ever, or else everyone will believe in him. So we have the evidence right here in, in God's word in, in the Bible. And we know this is true because people don't discredit it until you get hundreds and hundreds of years later. Then they say, well, Jesus didn't perform those miracles. Jesus really didn't do that. So our faith is built upon evidence. And it takes some work to see the evidence and to come to have faith in Jesus. The third thing that we get from this text is an idea that I believe is about commitment. You know, people seek superficial needs. Um, we ask, if you ask an average American teenager uh, what they need to survive, how many of them you think would say, I need my cell phone? <laughs> Most that probably say they need their cell phone. Uh, we, now, I grew up B.C., that's before cell phones. I grew up B.C. We didn't have cell phones. And uh, I've tell you my daddy, I say, Daddy, I need $20 to put some gas in the car and go do this. And he said, y you need it? He didn't stutter. I just did that for emphasis. You need it? No. Uh, it, you want it. It's not that you need it. He said, Here's, I'm supplying your needs, son. You got food to eat, feet under my table, roof over your head clothes on your back and you got air to breathe that's really all you need if you have those four things you can survive this world food well we'll add water to that so water food water air shelter you have those things you can survive you can live a physical life you can't live spiritually but you can live physically so we have those superficial needs. And Jesus taught, you, you just follow me around because I fed you. I fed, filled your tummy up. I want to tell you about some spiritual needs that you have. Jesus says, I am. This is our first I am statement that we come across in the Gospel of John. I am the bread of life. You know what the Jews heard? The Jews heard the first two words. I am and as soon as Jesus said, I am, their minds immediately raced back to Exodus chapter 3, verse 14, where Moses is standing at the bush that's burning but not being consumed. And the Lord, the Lord God is in that bush. And uh, Moses said, and the Lord God says to Moses, go down and bring my people out of Egypt. And Moses says, who will I say sent me? And God says, I am. I am that I am. That means I exist I've ex always existed. And when Jesus says, I am the bread of life, they didn't even hear bread of life. All they heard was, I am, and they immediately thought about, Jesus is claiming to be God. And it went all over them. But Jesus could make that claim because he is God. He proved it by the miracles that he performed. And Jesus saying, is confronting them with his deity, I am and too often we come to uh, Jesus with our superficial needs. And what we really need is an intimate relationship with God Almighty. The crowd was unable to accept what Jesus said, that he came down from heaven. And so our tendency is, uh, oftentimes in the church, is to tone down the message of Jesus. So that it will be edible enough that people will swallow it, so to speak. We cannot tone down the message of Jesus. Eat my flesh, drink my blood. It sounds like the ravenings of a madman. But here's what Jesus really means. He's emphasizing a proper relationship with the Son of Man is an all-consuming one. Jesus says the true followers abide in me and I in them. Jesus insists on more than being a mere acquaintance. Jesus is, insists on being more than merely a friend. Jesus insists on being more than a soldier, more than a subject to the king, more than any of those. Jesus 
demands a closer relationship than a general and his army, the rabbi and his students. It's more like Jesus wants our all, everything. Like bread is digested and absorbed by every cell of your body, you must have Jesus in your innermost being. Every fiber of your meaning, being is focused about Jesus. Jesus still rejects that casual relationship, that occasional relationship. His desire more than anything else is to be close to us, as close as the blood that runs in our veins, as close as the, the breath that's in our lungs, as close as the marrow in our bones. There can be no secret places hidden from Jesus. It's just not part of Jesus. We've been studying the book of Colossians. We talked about Christ is all and in all briefly today. We talked more about it a couple of weeks ago. But that's all about Jesus. That whole book is Jesus Christ, nothing more, nothing else, nothing less. It's all about Jesus. You see, this is the bread of life. He will accept nothing less than a 100% intimate relationship with him. And are you willing to make that kind of commitment to Jesus. You know, in a marriage relationship, we have the vows. Uh, probably every single person here that got married or is married had some vows that you expressed to one another. Am I not right? You can nod your head now. I know you're not falling asleep. Uh, you, you had some vows that you said to one another special meaning that they have said to one another. And part of those vows, uh, at least in our case, was be faithful unto death. That means we are exclusive. No open marriage. We're excluded. I am Betty's and she is mine. And that's just the way it's going to be. And some people aren't, aren't committed to that kind of relationship. Some people can't handle that. Or they choose not to handle that. But see, Jesus calls us to be in a kind of relation. It's exclusive. I belong to Jesus. He belongs to me. He is the bread of life. See, point number four is we have a choice. We're all faced with a choice. The Jews on this day, they grumbled and they complained. They said, "Woo!" This teaching is hard. It's difficult. This really was a turning point in the ministry of Jesus. See, you're talking about his disciples. It says his disciples, not the 12, his disciples. There were other people that were his disciples. They were turning and walking away from Jesus. They wanted a king, but they didn't want to receive Jesus as Lord. And you got a picture in your mind. Here is Jesus at Capernaum in the synagogue. He's teaching. He's taught this hard teaching, if you will. And people are getting up, walking out the door. And they're leaving. They're walking out the door. I ask you this. Do you think Jesus wanted them to stay? Sure he did. Sure he did. Jesus, Jesus turns to the 12. He looks at them and he says, what about you? Maybe you're confused. Maybe you're frustrated. Maybe you're disappointed. What about you? What are you going to do? Francis Schaeffer said he would talk to non-believers and he would face them to look at life as an alternative to faith in Jesus. And asking these questions, are you willing to live in a world where there is no absolute right or wrong? Anything goes. Are you willing to live in a world where there is no hope of life after death? Are you living to, willing to live in a world where there is no basis for human dignity? It's just a dog-eat-dog -dog world where there is no meaning no reason for life except what you can get. And he said at the, he just over and over hammer those issues and think about those things and bring them to the brink of despair. And it's then that we realize, along with Peter, to whom shall we go? You have the words 
of eternal life. Only in Jesus, only in Jesus is there eternal life. By way of conclusion, I want you to think about this. What did Jesus want? No one ever wanted people to be saved more than Jesus. No one ever wanted people to be saved more than Jesus. Jesus wanted every one of those disciples that were walking out of the room to be saved. It was breaking his heart to watch them go out of the room. Did he run after them to bring them back? Did he offer to soften up the message? I'll, I'll, you, you don't have to eat my bread and drink my flesh, or eat my flesh and drink my blood, sorry. You don't have to do that. No. He stood firm on his teaching. He is the bread of life. And he will accept nothing less than for each one of us to eat his flesh and drink his blood. Oh, it's a hard message. It's a hard message. But he gives life. Eternal life. You notice what the disciples said? To whom shall we go? What did Peter say? Peter's always the one, isn't he? Peter says, we believe. We believe. You have the words of eternal life. But we believe. And have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Verse 69. Do you believe in Jesus? With all of your heart, will you give Jesus everything? The cost, the commitment is not half-hearted Christianity. That just doesn't work. It's not viable. We're all in for Jesus because he was all in for us. Are you ready to respond to Jesus? If you're not a Christian, why not become one today? Why not confess your faith in Jesus as the Son of God? Repent of past sins, submit to the waters of baptism, to rise and walk a new kind of life, knowing that Jesus' blood cleanses us right then, washes all those sins away, takes them out of the way. If you're a Christian, maybe you haven't been as committed as you need to be. Maybe you need to recommit your life to Jesus. We're going to sing a song to encourage you to respond to Jesus. Won't you come while we stand? While we stand.